Thanks for listening to the Music Production Podcast. I want to tell you about my new Ableton Live pack called 16-Bit, and you're listening to it right now. It's a collection of Ableton Live instrument racks made from samples of the Sega Genesis YM2612FM synth sound chip. So using a special MIDI interface called Gen MDM, I loaded sounds from some of my favorite games and sampled them and made instruments out of them that you can use in Ableton Live. It's a really cool way to get a very nostalgic sound from one of the coolest sound chips of the 16-bit era and the chiptune era in general, in my opinion. The 16-bit Ableton Live pack is available to members of the Music Production Club during September 2020. So if you join the club during September 2020, you will get 16-bit Ableton Live pack and have these sounds for your music. And you'll continue to get downloads and resources and live classes online every single month. Check it out at brianfunk.com mpc. How's it going, everybody? And welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I have musician, producer, and author, Rivita. And she is doing quite a lot of stuff, like some cool stuff with her music, uh, the videos, and um, also put together a book called The Composer Cave Challenge, which I think I read was written mostly during quarantine time, which is... I think is awesome that you, you know, used that time and um, yeah. made the most of it. So very happy to have you here. Welcome to the show. Very happy to be on the show, Brian. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I've been enjoying your work, your music and uh, the production of it. And um, you've even got some cool like tips on your blog So for other <laughs> producers. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me... The best way I learn how to do things is when I write it down or when I explain it to somebody. Mm. So a lot of my productions, I actually write down what my intentions are before I actually go into it. And that way, if I learn something, I probably just take notes. Mm. And it helps me in, in the sense like to share them on my blog or to put it in a book by, okay, now my notes are somewhere tangible. And if I need to access them, then I can access them. Somebody else needs to see them. They can see them. That's cool. Um, And it's funny you say that because I keep this like running (laughs) to-do list of things that I like to do. And at the top of my list for like the last month, and I haven't moved it, I just wrote set intentions when I do things. And And the idea is like just... All right. Um, and it applies mostly to music, I think. But like, what am I trying to do with this piece of music when I'm writing it? What are people supposed to be doing when they hear it? And it's been yeah. very helpful to just have like a, a direction or a spot on the map that I'm trying to get to. Yeah, I think it comes down to like conscious living. Mm-hmm. Now that, like, especially during the pandemic, like, but even before that, I was very much looking into minimalism and, like, being more conscious about what my intentions are behind the words that I speak or write or um, say to somebody. And it's been, it's such a good habit to have because it makes you so self-aware. And at the same time, if I'm working on something, it's been really good because if I put a piece of music out and I kind of question myself, like what my intentions are, where do I see this going? And if I if I ask all the right questions, the universe kind of automatically answers them too. And it's been, it's it's an interesting journey, you know, if you look at it like that. Yeah. You know, I found that it does make you think a little bit, like you said, even like what you say to people, like sometimes you've, I've found this like in my relationships, like uh, where um, maybe I'm saying something to try to pull something out. Like I want you to give me this or that. And yeah. it, it kind of like makes you call yourself out a little bit where you're like, okay, you're just you know, whether you're trying to cause drama or just see that you're getting an emotional reaction or you want validation, you want someone to tell you good job. It's um, it's something that's worth keeping track of to just pay attention to. 
Yeah, and you know, as I grow as an artist, and the more music I create, I realize I end up answering all my questions myself through the music. Mm. So all I have to do then is to actually go back and just listen to my own voice rather than try to get those answers from an external source. Do you mean like your lyrics specifically or just? No, okay. So if I'm having a day where I'm like, oh, so and so said this to me, I feel like I feel like I'm alone or, you know, if I feel all those emotions which are like guilt, shame, like, you know, oh, today I'm feeling guilty because I ate a tub of ice cream. Then at that point, you have to find things to also feel good about rather than wallowing in that misery. So at the same time, I I can be like, I wrote a book. I did this. Mm. I did that. And then, and that's why we create to not only for ourselves, but for it might remind somebody else, you know, like when I was writing the book, I actually have a couple of people on my Facebook, somebody I went to university with, um, somebody else I know through music who's who've written a book. And I was like, if I surround myself with people who are on their path and who are doing all, who have good habits, mm. like, okay, if you have a friend who goes to the gym and you see their Insta stories every day, you'll be like, I should go to the gym. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, I was like, I really want to surround myself with people who are doing good stuff, not only for everyone else, but for themselves and have those habits in my own routine. Mm. Yeah, I've heard it said that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with, meaning mm -hmm. like you will be as nice as they are. You'll be as happy as they are or as sad as they are. And they've even said um, you will earn as much money as the average of the five people or you'll be as satisfied in your life. And I tell this to my students, especially like my high school students. I teach high school English. And um, I, I tell them like, think about it. You know, if you have five friends who are going to go out every Friday night and vandalize the neighborhood, you might not agree with that, but maybe like one Friday every three months you go with them and you know, and yeah. you might get caught up in that. Whereas you might have five friends that go to the library to study every night, every Friday night, and you might hate studying, but you might get bored one Friday night and just go along with them. And you're doing those habits now. And I think yeah. it makes a lot of sense. And, and I guess that motivated you to start writing your story <laughs> or, or not story, but your, your book. <laughs> um, Kind of, yes. <laughs> or maybe it gave you um, the inspiration, just... So how the book came about was actually during the pandemic, I was feeling very, especially like when it began. So I just moved to LA. I've been here only, I, I, I it's going to be one year on the 28th of September. Oh, cool. So when the pandemic began, I just moved to LA. And I was just like, oh, God, I don't know that many people here. I do. I did make lots of friends initially. But, you know, I'm still supposed to be quarantining by myself. So I actually was like doing this thing called um, Cave Day, which is an organization. And they organize these caves every uh, almost every day. And you just sit with people on there and you do your own work. Like everyone's doing something different. Mm. So I was like, during cave day, I would write music or I would sometimes I would literally just clean my house because I felt that emotional support. But then eventually I was like, I really want to do something with other musicians. Like I want to make other music friends. So I came up with this idea that, okay, I'm going to do these composer caves and I'm going to invite my composer friends to come and sit with me on Zoom for three hours. And I will send them three parameters to write music to, like a brief. Hmm. Um, so I started putting this on Facebook and I got like a couple of people who started being like engaged with it. So initially we did it on Tuesdays. And a few people were like, you know, the timing does not work for me. I'm in England or I'm in Spain. I'm here and there. Like, 
the timing was not working for a few people but then eventually i had a conversation with one of them and we decided together that okay this is the time and day that works for both of us and both of us want to do it regularly so like that thursdays at 12 pm became a regular thing that we started doing the composer games and every week i would send out the three parameters and then after the cave like after 3 hours of writing music we would then have a conversation like how did you feel about this one today mm. and what did we learn and we would come to like similar but like similar but different conclusions so it was a great way to start a community i really started looking forward to thursdays and seeing the same people again and started feeling like this week sense of connection and accomplishment and at the same time over a period of few months i realized like my composition skills had become like slowly like i was becoming more confident mm. my music was sounding better i was trying new things so i was like okay what can i and all these parameters kept like and i loved writing them like i loved writing them the challenges so like, themselves the, yeah the challenges yeah. themselves so i loved writing them so much i was like how do i reach people who are in different time zones who can't necessarily come to the cave or you know everyone's not comfortable sitting on zoom and mm-hmm. writing music along like sometimes i literally just sleep all day long and write music all night long and i personally i've learned so much from just reading books like sometimes i know there's youtube and i've gone to music school and i've studied but there are so many things i've actually learned from reading somewhere so it's like hey maybe i can just put all these parameters in like a book and put it on amazon and see what happens mm. and i've always wanted to write a book <laughs> So it's like this is the easiest one that for me because this is my area of study this is what i feel most confident talking about and i i wanted to just share it with the world so it's been it's been great i love that story and it's so cool that it just came out of a natural situation where you were looking for people to work with and you were coming up with these things and just sort of discovered that this is a lot of fun coming up with these challenges <laughs> Yeah. Can you give an example of what a challenge might look like? Um okay, so I'm going to actually look inside my book and find one. <laughs> okay, cool. So is okay. this the kind of book we can just turn to any page? It's not really like a cover to cover type of thing. Um so I have actually put 21 challenges in. And yes, you could possibly just pick up the one you like mm-hmm. on the day and do it. like set 3 hours aside and kind of time yourself take five three breaks in between five minutes long just to refresh your brain you could do that you could totally just pick up one challenge and you can do the same challenge over and over again right um you can literally go back to the same challenge and then do it again after a few weeks and see if you would come up with something different this time It's up to you like at the end of the day I feel like I wrote it but now every it's like everyone else can take it to another level and yeah. that should be it's like a video game for me because <laughs> even through the even through the actual caves when people come up with their compositions and sometimes they share them mm. I'm like wow like I would not have to, like I wouldn't even have imagined doing something so cool So it's been fun. Um so I'm going to pick up one. Um which one? Okay, let's see. I'm just going to open a random page and find one. Okay. Want to find the fun one. Okay, so this is called the Phrygian dominant. Uh hmm. and it's challenge 7 in my book. So the first parameter is use seventh chords. The second parameter is limit your composition to no more than 5 instruments in 3 minutes long. And the third parameter is think about working tones from a Phrygian dominated scale into your composition. So I think at the end of the day it's really to get someone to think about that scale. Right. 
and be in that mood. So with each exercise, I personally try to set a mood rather than. Mm -hmm. And it's been really cool because like my own theoretical concepts became clearer over a period of time while doing this. Yeah, I like that. And that that probably gets people to experiment a little because I I don't think um, a lot of people generally without like some kind of academic musical background are like, let's check out the Phrygian mode here. And, and you know what I mean? Like that's like um, a pretty outside of the comfort zone thing probably for a lot of people. Yeah. And, and you also keep it kind of simple in that it can only be this long and you're only going to have, I think you said five instruments. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I think um, the first, the first challenge is actually the, li- like it, it is a limit. And I personally, when I went to, when I studied composition, because we had so many limits on what we could do and couldn't do, and we had all these deadlines, that just became like a tool for me rather than something inhibiting me. I was like, this is actually a great tool to have because it's so easy to go into logic or start writing a piece of music and then have a hundred tracks of lord knows what is going on with this composition but when i start limiting things it's so much cleaner and clear like Mm. i can actually make changes much easier i have more control over my composition um and i I can explain it much better to somebody who's listening and if i share it with someone and they say can you change that i can totally go inside and change it without even thinking Oh, how do I find that track? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that can be a problem, and especially if you don't organize yourself as you go. Yeah. So a little bit of the goal of this book is to get people to think about getting organized with their work and trying to give them different tools that if they like them, they can just add them to their toolbox. Mm. I think it's a great idea because... You know, as you were saying, there's endless possibilities. I mean, I always think back to when I started and I had a guitar, a microphone, and I finally got a four track recorder, which seemed to open the world up. A little tape cassette recorder that I'm sad I don't still have. But I think it just stopped working and run down. But anyway, um, um I didn't have as much choice. I just had my guitar and if I was brave enough to use my voice. And if I found something I could bang on that made some sound too, that's what I could do. But now when there's every sound, every instrument, every plugin with every preset, and it's so easy to just get overwhelmed or just lost searching for what you're going to do. To have those limitations, I think is really powerful. And And I do like sometimes having them imposed upon me is I don't always have the discipline to say, okay, today's Phrygian day and I'm going to work on that. But if I'm told that, it's definitely a different story. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, uh, we most of the composers, we are working by ourselves or like musicians in general. And sometimes we do need somebody to hold us accountable. Like if we were working in an office with like colleagues or with, somebody like a boss Mm -hmm. we would not be running around with so many plugins or (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah they they would uh either not give us access to it or just not put up with it like you got too much going on here just trim it down yeah and i think that's where getting a proper education in music also helps because while i was in music school like that's what my teachers would call me out on Mm. Or they'd help me see, you know, like, what if you were to just, like, I think one of my teachers one day said to me, less is more, Ravita, less is more. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that for the first time from an art teacher in high school. And it took me a minute to wrap my head around it. I was like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> more <laughs> is more and less is less. But um, as she would explain as... I forget what we were doing exactly, um, but 
she just showed how like if I keep adding stuff, let's just say it's a painting, like to this painting of this little cottage you made, everything you add takes away from the attention on that cottage. And every single time you add something, and it happens in music too. Um, so I teach a sampling course for Berkeley Online. And one of the projects is um, to just, you know, make um, make your own instrument. It's more like, more like an assignment, but make your own instrument with your voice and then add things in there. And if you keep adding too much, you lose the sense of that instrument with the voice where the whole point of you making an instrument out of your voice and sampling is so that you can get the quality of your voice. But if you start adding yeah. 700 things on top of it, you don't hear those subtleties that happen exactly. in that instrument. You lose the detail. That's how, I think that's how I built myself up as an artist. Like I started doing music because as a kid, I only had one question and that was, how do I put chords to this, like the melodies that come inside my head? Mm. And I would, at the back of like my notebooks and like in journals, I would write down lyrics and sometimes I would have a melody for them. And I had no idea how to put music to these melodies that were inside my head. And trust me, I didn't figure it out until I actually went to university. Mm. And I still didn't know what the question was. Like, I knew that, okay, I just want to put, like, music to this going on inside my head. And over a period of time, as I developed myself as an artist, I realized that my, the strongest suit that I had was my voice. And that's what I needed to work on because that's the most unique thing about me. I can use so many plugins and I can create so many sounds, but my voice is the most unique mm. sound I would get as an individual. And there is no other person with the same voice on this planet. So for me, like that really became the foundation of me trying to develop my sound as an artist. And I totally agree with you. At, at the end of the day, if you listen to a really good song, you just focus more on the voice of the artist more than anything else going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I've noticed that. Um, I noticed that in particular one time seeing um, just like a really professional band playing with a bunch of um, more amateur bands. And I just kind of noticed like, wow, the, you know, these amateur bands have so many things going on. There's all these guitars and all these melodies and there's a vocal and there's the drummers playing every drum at the same time all the time. And and then the, the other band came out and um, it was just really easy to follow along. There was really no more than three things to listen to at any given time. There was the rhythm and there was the voice and maybe this something else would come in like after the voice finished to just fill in. And... Um, it was just kind of like, I don't know why it never occurred to me so clearly, but maybe it was just the fact that seeing the bands before and it was just kind of, you know, I, I could, you couldn't remember anything you heard after it was over. It just kind of came and went in this fury of sound. But then when the other band came out, it was just like, oh, I got the melody and, and there it is. And it was um, just... And, and that happens too, I think, in, in the DAW and your, in your computer where you can just keep adding things and yeah. <laughs> go to town. I wanted to ask you, um, what was your like study in music at school? Was it like a compositional thing or any kind of performance? So I actually first got my bachelor's in um, popular music performance voice. And I did that at BIM London, which used to be tech music schools back then. Um, and it was a really fun program because I got to study composition. Like I got to study production, composition, and then I had to perform every week. Mm -hmm. So the performances were really fun because in third year, I remember waking up, 9 waking up 8 a.m. to get to class at 9 a.m. to sing Iron Maiden for two hours. <laughs> 
Nice. So I literally <laughs> did that at university. Like I got to sing Iron Maiden and I got to sing Steely Dan and Stevie Wonder and um wow. then I did a world module where I was singing a song in like different languages. I mm. sang a Brazilian samba um in Portuguese. So I had to sit and learn a samba in Portuguese. And while I was in London um another thing i actually did was i used to play as a samba sista in a samba band and i played at uh, i played with them at the notting hill carnival and it was literally 200 people playing together simultaneously wow. the same thing and the energy was mind blowing like i would never forget that experience and it was raining really hard because that's typical for london but we were dressed up in our proper samba clothes and we had our drums on and we paraded throughout like it was so insane mm. the energy and you know just vibing with each other um and then i actually went on to do a masters in composition for film and tv mm. at kingston university which is also in london and that's where i really started that's that was the program that felt absolutely right for me because that's what we would do we would sit and we would write music and that felt really really good um and then after that i actually had to go back home to india after finishing my studies so i was in india for one year um i taught there and i worked on my debut ep tribal love and then i started making music videos i picked up a camera started making music videos and my music video listen actually went to um different film festivals and i was like hey maybe this is something i can explore at the same time i felt very lonely when i was in india hmm. it's like i have no friends here all my friends are in london and my school friends um some of them got married you know like some of them moved some of them got married so they were all busy with their lives and i just felt slightly isolated um so i was like hey maybe i can either do a phd or i can do another masters so a phd is like a five year long commitment or four or five years long especially in the us and i'm not sure i was ready to make that kind of a commitment so i googled video and audio programs and i found this one at syracuse university which was one year long and it was called audio arts and i applied for it and they gave me a scholarship so i was like this is cool so i came to the us to do that program but i always kind of in the back of my head really wanted to come and live in la Uh so I came and I did that program which was really fun I actually ended up going to South Africa while doing that program and it opened many doors for me like I worked as an audio engineer on quite a few projects I got to compose music for like other student films and it just opened a lot of like me started making me think about a lot of things that I had not thought about before so that kind of sums up my educational background in music. What kind of things did it make you think about that you never thought about before? Um so my intention before starting the program was that after this I'll apply for a PhD or I want to become a professor. Mm. But while I was doing the program I actually started collaborating with local people in Syracuse. I found this beautiful ballet dancer um and how that came about is another like incredible story mm-hmm. because i was looking for a ballet dancer for to dance on one of my music videos and she literally found me on craigslist hmm. and we ended up and this was this was a beautiful like 12 year old kid who danced like an angel and her mom reached out to me and we ended up making two music videos together and then i went to uh, south africa to work on a journalistic project as an audio engineer but then there i actually heard the music of the local people and i was like 
they don't have a studio. I really want to document this. So I transformed the hotel conference room into a studio and I invited them and I recorded it and actually put it on the internet. And I called this my traveling studio. And it just opened so many ideas like inside my head that, wow, there, there is so much music being made in the world. Like there's an abundance of music mm. and you can literally like pick and choose where you want to go and how you want to work on it. At the same time, I was also traveling to all these music conferences like South by Southwest. And um, I actually took an impromptu, impromptu trip to Nashville. So just like being in those music centric environments and watching like live concerts. I went to see John Mayer, I went to see Shakira, I went to see Kimbra, like just watching all that. I was like, there are so many endless possibilities and you can be whoever you want. Hmm. You know what I like about that story too is um, like you're getting your formal education, right? You know, but um, there's, there's also this other education you're giving yourself too. And I think that's an important thing for people to, Keep in mind, um, especially young people like going into college, whatever field you're going into. I mean, I think music is is a especially competitive one, but I think any field like you know we've been taught growing up, you just go to college and then they give you your job and you're all good, you know. But it's, it's not like that. Um, you have to really work, and um, yeah. your story is a really good one of not just taking the education you receive, but going out and like really getting the education yourself. Yeah. And in my experience, I've only ever learned by doing things. And I mm. think that's where my education in London was so important because it was very practical. We were not really about like we all did the same exercises, but we were actually performing and learning to perform or performing on stage, everyone does differently. Like you can't yeah. sound the same as another person. So that education was so different from the traditional education that I got in like school or high school. Mm-hmm. That it just made me realize if I really want to do music, I just have to do it. It's like a lifestyle. It's It's a way of life rather than oh, I will go to university and then I'll become a musician. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. And that that's the best education always when it's real world. I mean, so much, I'm a teacher, so I can tell you, like so much of the work that students are asked to do is just, it's make-believe. It's it's not anything you'll ever have to do beyond your schooling. You're, you're learning how to be good at school <laughs> most of the time. And having those real world things where you're actually like, because like then in a sense, like when you're performing, you're also now the teacher to the other students and, and you're also learning from their work instead of most of the time, you never see what anyone else does as their work. Yeah. And especially when I was doing my master's, I actually learned more from my peers. I was the youngest person in the group, like when I was doing my master's in composition, And some of my classmates had a lot of experience. Like they had gone and written music for trailers and they were working for music libraries. They had already worked at studios and they were kind of just getting this to enhance their professional work. So just being in the company of those people who had worked on music, one of my classmates had actually been in a very successful band. And he had like toured the world with that band. Mm. And so just listening to their stories, like them talking about, oh, you know, I was actually touring with this girl and we went to Germany together and we did this, that, like just hearing those stories, that opened my mind up. Because if you're just in a classroom, you're just kind of hearing what the professor or the tutor is saying. And you're taking that technical information, but then actually hearing the stories behind that technical information and becoming emotionally connected to it Mm. is where things start to like click. Right, right. 
Yeah, that's that's really cool. I, and I do get some of that in my Berkeley class where, you know, sometimes I have people in that class and I don't understand why I'm the teacher. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I know. I know what you mean. It's, you know, maybe I just know how to use the program, I guess. But, <laughs> you know, like their experience sometimes is is incredible. So, I mean, to just have conversations with them, to ask them simple questions, like, um, can really open your eyes as to how things actually are. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, our role as like, not just as teachers, but as colleagues and peers and fellow human beings is sometimes to just hold, like keep each other honest. Mm -hmm. You know, like so many years into my work as an artist, there are still days where I am like, I don't feel like doing anything today. I'm just going to binge watch TV shows. <sighs> but if I have a lesson with somebody scheduled in, or if I have like my composer cave, then automatically I'm like, okay, today I need to get dressed because I, I'm committed to doing this with Brian or I'm committed to doing this with so-and-so. And that's the whole point of having this community, you know, like having a community of musicians and doing it together. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a huge one. The accountability, the just, because that's like the hardest part. Uh, I mean, as much as I love doing all the stuff I do, there's always the part of me that, you know, just wants to stay at rest or, <laughs> or it's the getting going. And every time I start, I realize why I do it because it's fun. But um, when you have people, like you just have no choice. When when we have our conversation at 4 p.m., like like I got to be there. It, it has to happen. Exactly. And, yeah. and um, I've tried to build those things into my life a little bit in some of the work I do where I am purposely holding myself accountable to other people that um, it does help. It does. And while I was actually, when I was studying in London, I don't think I ever missed a single class, you know, like mm. I would always be there. I would always show up and that made me feel so good about myself. I was like, I'm the reliable person who always yeah. shows up. I actually became like a student rep. And I would advocate for the other students, like if they wanted to talk about something or if they felt something was going on, I'd ask them questions. And I realized like I had so much to give. And that is the whole point of like university or having a social network. Because these days, I think students are feeling very isolated, staying at home. And some of them are just not getting the university experience. Yeah, But it is so important. Like, it's not about, oh, I paid this much money to get that information. It's mm -hmm. about having those friends for life and seeing yourself in different situations and how you handle them. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's honestly what you're paying for, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you're paying just to go and get the piece of paper at the end, I mean... I don't know. I don't think that's going to do you too much good. But uh, to really soak it up and make the most of it, is that's yeah. where it's at. And mm. that's how I knew like music is like my life, literally. Because for me, it was such a 24-7. It still is. Like, it's such a 24-7 thing. Like, I would see music in... While I'm walking on the street, I'd see something and I was like, oh, that sparked an idea in my brain. Like the other day I was walking down the street and I saw this sign and it said speed limit. And I literally came home and wrote a song called Speed Limit oh, after yeah? seeing that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's something I was speaking to my class with in our last chat. It's a sampling class, but I, I've come to really broaden the idea of sampling in my mind. I mean, it used to just be like a, a hip hop song that used the backing track from some famous song from years ago. That was all I knew of sampling. But as, a, as I've done it myself more and more and i recording instruments and making sounds and everything, um, I kind of realized like you're, you're always sampling. Like you're sampling like the idea of the speed limit sign or you're sampling a line from a conversation to use for lyrics later on. Exactly. To, to look at it that way, for me, like makes everything 
a potential source of inspiration. Yeah. If I, if I can just remind myself like, all right, like get in that mindset where I can soak up some ideas, suddenly like everything has something to offer. Yeah. And then I do these, um, I've been doing a lot of uh, writing exercises and thinking about all the good songs in the world. Like they are so tangible. Like you can possibly write a song about somebody you know, maybe even your pet. And then, you know, the little things that make them who they are. It's it's all about the little things mm. sometimes. It's not even about, you don't even have to go outside of yourself to look for something. Yeah. Uh, one of my, you remind me, one of my favorite records is uh, Nebraska by Bruce Springsteen. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, are you familiar with that particular record? Not really. No, I'm not. Um, because to me, it was like a different Bruce than what yeah. I knew growing up born in the USA yeah. and, and like that kind of thing. Um, because he did it all on a four track or an eight track maybe, but a cassette recorder in his bedroom basically. And they were going to re-record it and it just, they couldn't get it in the studio. The demo was just too good. So it's yeah. just him with his guitar and harmonica. And he's got this one song, uh, I think it's called Highway Patrolman. And it's about this guy and it, he's got a brother named Frankie and Frankie ain't no good. And Frankie is, he's like, you know, he's causing trouble and getting, and basically the way the song goes is he's, he's the police officer and he gets on a call and he's, he's chasing his brother and his brother gets to the state line and he lets him go. And, and oh, it, wow. And, um, but everything about the song is so specific. It's his brother Frankie yeah. and his wife Maria and all these little details of the song they were dancing to. And you would think that it would make it impossible for you to connect with because it's just too specific. I didn't have that situation. I'm not a police officer. Yeah. I don't have a brother named Frankie. But the fact that it's so specific, and there's a bunch of songs on the record that are like that, but it just makes it hit home so much harder as rather than if he would have just said, I've got a brother or, or and all those little details. It's fascinating to me how when you really pin it down, it actually yeah. becomes more accessible. Yeah, because I feel like it's almost like hearing a story, like watching a TV. Like it's so visual then, you know, mm -hmm. like the way you described it. I almost saw it in my mind. And then connect, like songs like that are so eternal because there are so many things happening in the world now. Like as soon as you said police officer, like the whole George Floyd thing came back to me. Mm -hmm. You know, like songs like that are so important important in a way because they make us realize we are human at the end of the day like mm. the way you describe it this person clearly like loves his brother and wants like is chasing after him but still just wants him to be free yeah yeah he can't bear to arrest his brother yeah it's like when it's your family sometimes you look the other way <laughs> and um yeah. people can relate to that i guess you know that, that's yeah. um and it is i guess like a funny thing to do um sometimes on your own because you feel like oh this is too much me but um i think it's uh, a fun thing to play with yeah yeah well, I look think at country is. music i mean country music is always so specific about what road they're driving on and what kind of pickup truck they have and <laughs> you know <laughs> I actually, um, two years back, I randomly decided I'm, I want to go somewhere. And I was in Syracuse at the time. So I went on Google and I was like direct flight, flights from Syracuse. And there was a direct flight that had just begun to Nashville. So I literally bought the ticket and the same day flew to Nashville. Nice. So I went to a Grand Ole Opry there, which is... Just they bring on five or six country artists and they sing. And there was one particular artist, I forget the name, but you know how he got on stage and then he talked and he said, I have three daughters. And when my first one was born, I looked her in the eyes. And, you know, she got married recently 
and I just could not help but you know write about the way I felt when I saw her for the first time and when I saw her in that dress mm. and you know like that when people talk genuinely from the heart about something or someone they love the experience is so much different like we could talk about facts and um technical difficulties or whatever all day long but at the end of the day that's what connects you to the world the emotion mm. yeah that's very true i think something uh you know, we've missed in the last few months too, just getting those little details, you know, oh, yeah. how's, how's little Johnny doing? Did, did he ever fix his fire truck? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> what, whatever it is, you know, like um, you get wrapped up in those stories. And, uh, and I guess it, uh, the, what happens when you get that specific is like those universal truths come out. Exactly. Yeah, and then at the end, of, like I have been doing the spiritual program for the past few weeks. Um, there's an app called Mind Valley, and it's called I've, Mind Body, Mind Valley, Valley. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so okay. I downloaded that app, and I am doing some spiritual programs on it with um, his name is Michael Beckwith. Okay. And. He founded um, an organization called Agape International, which is mainly spiritual. So he talks about, like you said, like the universal truths. And for me, like as when I was a kid, I studied physics in school and I studied chemistry and biology. And so many of the things that I read, like energy is neither created nor destroyed. Um, and about like gravity. So many of those things I emotionally connected to while I was studying music, while I was studying audio. Like when I was a kid, I had studied a waveform, but then recording it and then looking at it and then working with it. That's when I was like, oh, this is a sign, you know, like yeah. this is that's when I really, really connected with all of my science background mm. as a kid. And I was like, OK, now this makes sense. <laughs> yeah when i started learning about sine waves and synthesis i was like i, I kind of want to go back to math and like <laughs> understand the graphs where that would produce the sign like why did that happen what what is that all about like and i guess that's really the key to education is like one you need that like curiosity or that spark or that connection yeah yeah and at the time like if somebody would have connected it to music for me if somebody would have been like, look, this is how you do it. And like, things would have been so much easier. Like I wouldn't yeah. have, uh, at the time, I just felt like I was regurgitating. Like I was reading right. all these facts and I was just spitting them out. But to actually now connect, one of my professors literally showed us, opened up the microphone and they showed us that, okay, a dynamic microphone is actually a battery and um, a condenser is a capacitor. And then we opened up and we looked at the plates inside the condenser microphone. And I was like, oh, wow, high school physics finally makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's useful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's cool, right? Like if those connections can be made. I, I get really, and that's, you know, before we started talking, you know, I said, I say this to everybody, like, you know, we have some topics we can get to, but I'm happy to let this wander off. And here we are talking about <laughs> this stuff. I had no idea we we're going to it. But um, the reason I'm I'm so open to that is because I just find it interesting how things connect. And it seems yeah. like the more you learn about one thing, the more you actually understand about other things. And, and this is a good case in that, um, when once those connections are made then it's like oh okay and like there's a part of me now that almost wants to go back into math class to just find out for myself for you know how how all that stuff works and why it, it makes sense the way it does and i'm sure there's a good explanation as to why a sine wave is such a pure tone and the, probably the mathematical equation is perfect somehow <laughs> you know really elegant so uh 
it's uh it's a cool thing i think to just sort of see where these things come together and uh, i think it really helps you uh, just get a grasp of how everything works yeah and especially for like us millennials like we grew up with so much technology and everything like all of our technology like is just made of zeros and ones mm. like it's just binary code at the end of the day so it's really interesting like how everything is actually made of numbers right. and how numbers are like there there are like you said there are infinite possibilities so for me that really boils down to the fact that i love looking at it as abundance like you know i could wake up and i could write 10 songs in one day like there are so many songs i could work on so i don't really need that external validation from anything Mm-hmm. but rather to find it inside me like to find those ideas inside me and to work on them and to get closer to myself as i grow up mm. yeah well is that in any connection to what you you were talking about we might have got a little sidetracked you would get into the the mind valley thing <laughs> yeah yeah that that is what i'm doing with mind valley like mm-hmm. um So when I was in Syracuse and then when I was in New York I was learning all these things and I was I realized there was a disconnect between my values like who I am spiritually like my spirit and who I was projecting on the outside and that's when I I, I was on YouTube one day and I saw this video um it was somebody called Vishen Lakhiani and he was talking about a book he wrote the book was called the code of the extraordinary mind and i bought that book and i read it and ever since then i started making all these connections you know between things that were happening in my life i started thinking a lot about oh wow like my own songs started making different sense to me mm. So I think and then like I said like all that high school math kind of started making sense and that's when I really feel like I emotionally started connecting with the people I was meeting the work because I felt such a strong sense of purpose. Hmm. And sometimes when we are younger or when we are in university we are so focused on doing this assignment or doing it just to like being com- competitive but i really realize like things are not competitive they are actually everyone's on their own path and everyone can be happy yeah oh, yeah i think that that absorption in your work can last well beyond university and into yeah. in your whole life really um but yeah we are as a human species we everything that's we have is the result of teamwork and put building off of the people before us and working with the people that are with us. Yeah, and the people who are going to come after us, you know. Yeah. I think I went like on a really huge tangent there. <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> no, that's fine. Like I said, I'm I'm totally okay with that because I think that's all interesting, you know, because you're not finding success as an artist in a vacuum. You know, yeah. this isn't all happening because you went to school and did whatever you did. Like there's a lot of other factors that come into this. And and I think like you 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 definitely have a, an interesting path too where I mean, here you are, you're you're in LA now, right? Yeah. So you're on the other side of the world from where you grew up. And that's I am. that's a a brave move in itself to just follow that dream and to go with that and um i'm sure that has to have some kind of impact on how you see things how you see yourself how you see it must give you a sense of confidence that you can do that it must also be as you said you felt isolated sometimes too so that must yeah. color your work tremendously it does like my the last single i released i believe came from such a like place of loneliness and vulnerability that when when i was working on that song i i was also at the same time in the back of my head just thinking over and over again i don't want to feel like this again 
Right. And I'm going to put that in a song as a reminder, you know. So for me, a lot of my music is a reminder to myself. Like, this is how I felt that day when I wrote this song. This is how I don't want to feel again. <laughs> hmm. um, and then, like you said, it's such a personal journey writing these songs that even if only one person connects with them, at the end of the day, my job as an artist or like as a creator is to take the idea in my head and to bring it to conception the best I can and then rely on the fact that there are so many amazing people in this world and somebody might pick it up and take it to another level. Right. You know how somebody, if somebody puts out a song and somebody else goes and covers it and makes it even better, like we have to be open to the fact. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized over the years, like I used to be very closed off like that. Like I would become very possessive about my work. But as I'm growing up, as I've traveled so much and I've made all these connections, I'm like, you know, people really like, especially in the music, especially people doing well in music, they are really doing it for the music. Like the goal at the end of the day is to create something beautiful. Like it isn't to, it's not competition. Like even if they project that, their intention in their heart is always to do really well, good work. Mm -hmm. And for me to like really understand that, was mind-blowing because it connected me to so many amazing people when I started looking at things like that. Hmm. Yeah, the work does take on a life of its own after you let it go. And, yeah. Uh, and I think, um, you know, um, something I got out of like studying literature was that the meaning of the work is, you know, I grew up like thinking it was the author meant this that's what it is and here's the meaning the teacher's giving me the answer this is the theme of the story the end you know you got it right or wrong on the test <laughs> but as i got a little deeper into it i started to see like oh wow like this person has a totally different viewpoint and they're reading it from an entirely different perspective maybe even in time you know like we can look back at things and read it from this perspective there's so many different yeah. ways to look at it and um, it just like kind of occurred to me like the meaning happens more in the reader or at least somewhere between the author and the reader. And as, as a listener in music, you bring yourself into everything. So a song you put out might be one thing to you and then just an entirely different thing to someone else. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. That's why yeah. I feel like it's our job to encourage people to write the music they want to write. Like your classes as um, with Berkeley, the sampling ones, they are important in the sense you're giving somebody the encouragement they need to go out and put their thoughts and their story and their own feelings into something they can keep forever hmm. it's it's incredible like all the friends i've made through music and all the things that i've experienced through music and all the places i've visited because of music yeah, yeah i always say the same thing um i had no idea when i first picked up that <laughs> guitar like where i was going and like even if you take the actual literal music out of it and just like you said, all the people and places and situations you find yourself in as a result is I have a totally different life right now. Who I knows? know. It's, <laughs> yeah, who knows? Like there are so many incredible things that have happened over the years that I've just done because I was motivated. Like I don't think I would have ever like left home if it, you know, like if it if yeah. I didn't feel that sense of that I have to go and do this. Like I have to learn this. And the more I traveled, the more I realized, you know, at the end of the day, everybody is the same. Like everyone wants to be loved and liked. And I've ended up making friends like all over the world. One of my friends is in Colombia. One of them is in Korea. Somebody is in London. Somebody is mm. in China. Like I've made so many friends 
and they are all such amazing people and we've connected over so many different things like food and movies and even if sometimes it's not even about like making it as an artist or having these many million views it's yeah. actually about you know the journey itself i think that's a good attitude um i can't exactly speak from experience on that but it it doesn't seem to um <laughs> You know, any accomplishment, um, you know, they feel great when you, when you accomplish things, when you meet goals or you yeah. um, reach milestones, but it, it does always fade. You know, there is like this like kind of, okay, uh, we did that. The, the human mind, I guess, it's part of how we've developed as civilization and everything like that. We just kind of keep looking for the next thing. But it's it's um, those experiences you get along the way, the people you meet, and the connections, and just uh, the the feeling you get from all of that is yeah. really and and like you you can't control like when those million views come or don't come like that that's just a byproduct of the work. But um, to see it for for that like where it takes you and the journey and. You know, and when I listen to interviews with people that have done great things, like that seems to be the thing they focus on. They don't say, and then the next million came in <laughs> and I had another zero on my bank account at the end of that number. Was, yeah. You know, that's that never comes up. It, and those conversations can, I've had such conversations and I'm like, they are so draining. Like, <laughs> I want to know. Um, I would rather talk about what you ate for breakfast. You know what I mean? Yeah. And especially like doing these things on Zoom, like as soon as you put your um, screen on, I was like, wow, I love your room. Hmm. You know, it's almost like being a teenager again. And yeah. you know, when you were kids, you would go to like each other's room and yeah. oh, wow, you have these like can I look at your clothes? And, you know, we would have those conversations at, as kids mm -hmm. that I feel like we just stopped having along the way. Like when I was in university, I had a friend and she would come over for tea all the time. And every time she would come, I would like clean up my dorm room and I would put mm -hmm. a kettle on. And then she would be like, I bought this coat today. You know, those conversations somehow yeah. get less and less as you grow up. But right. Now that we are on Zoom, I love like looking at people's space and going, oh, <laughs> can I look at that thing in the background? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's never about, uh, I mean, it's nice that we've done all these, we've accomplished all these things, but I think those are just good habits. Mm. Well, that's like just the people. It's it's uh, the personalities come out and, and that's... Yeah. That's Everyone's in a different uh, tangent, you know, like I might be focused on getting 100 views today and that's what's keeping my mind healthy today, you know, and tomorrow I might just be focused on writing another song. So it also depends like on the day you find somebody and what they are focused on on that particular day. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. It's something I always try to remember with people in general. So. You're just, you're no matter what you're just getting a slice of them, you know. And uh, yeah. I would probably hate mm -hmm. to be um, summed up in my small interaction with someone else, you know, at the store online, say, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Like, that's just the fraction of who they are. There's yeah, everyone then, is so deep and diverse in their own way. Yeah, and then I realized when I was in New York that it's so easy when people are really overwhelmed with life that they go around, like it's so easy for them to judge somebody they've just met because they just don't have the capacity to really pay attention to another person. Like they're so focused on, I need to get this project done and you are here to do this mm -hmm. rather than let's do it together and let's make it fun sometimes people just don't have that capacity and if you are the person who has it then I mean you are an asset you know like mm. you're there as service mm. <laughs> yeah uh, New York can be like that I can as a lifelong oh, yeah. New Yorker you know um there's, hey, really there's so many people everywhere um 
fact that it's not special when you see a person. <laughs> you know, it's like, here's another guy. What does he want? Yeah. I, I took a trip with one of my friends to Kansas out in the Midwest or, you know, right in the middle of the country. Um, I was probably like 18 or 19 years old. We went to Kansas uh, with his mom in a car, in a minivan. And when we got there, it was, there's no one there, like compared to what I'm used to. And we went to the mall and there we saw like maybe like eight people at the mall and they were all like, how y'all doing? What you guys doing today? Like in New York, like you just can't do that. Like to everyone you see on the street, you, you have to filter people out. It's just overload. Um, but yeah. in that situation, it was like nice to get stopped for a pleasant, friendly conversation about nothing. Um, so it, it like just changes how you see people, I guess, when you're, <laughs> you're not as overwhelmed and you're not, um, trying to swim through the crowd to get to where you have to go. Yeah. But I, I mean, I'm grateful for the experience of living in New York mm. and feeling like that, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I love New York. Um, the, uh, not to take away from it, but that is a, a feature. <laughs> yeah. And I'm grateful also because when I was in New York, I really found myself as an artist. Like, things were happening so fast. I would get all these... Like, I started traveling to New York City from Syracuse just to play shows. Hmm. And that's, that's when journey. I... And that, oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's when I realized that I was actually so much better on stage when I just showed up with my laptop and played one of my production and sang along. Mm -hmm. Like I could really make the crowd vibe doing that. Like I grew up as an artist when I moved to New York in so many different ways, just by downsizing my own, I, because you know, you're overwhelmed by the outside. So you start clearing up the inside, like you start clearing up your process and you're, and it was insane because I've played shows to, very few people but in New York even if I was just showing up without knowing anyone there would be people mm -hmm. so you had that like there would be people watching and I didn't have that ex that much experience of that in London like I had to invite people mm -hmm. but in New York there would always be a room full of people you know they come in after work just to look and that increased the pressure on me to perform really well and I'm grateful because under that, under those circumstances, I really became aware of, wow, this is how I interact with the crowd. This is what I'm supposed to do. And this is what I'm yeah. supposed to say. I became a much better performer living in New York City. I became more confident. And having, like walking through those crowds, having conversations, trying to get to somebody just the fact that you have to be so much more clear and clear about what you want to say, how you want to say it. It really gave me the experience of like making it in the crowd. And I, I don't think like I felt like that when I was in London. And um, there are all these people with a purpose who wake up with a purpose in New York and they really like they are in this big city. They have to get yeah. this done. I love that about New York. Yeah. All they say, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> yeah. But nowadays, you, if you make it anywhere, you make it everywhere. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but yeah, it does. There is something about the hustle that gets you going. You know, you can't walk through those streets and feel sleepy. <laughs> you know, you really do get like energized from it. Yeah. Hmm. And I am not a coffee drinker. So that was really hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> got to do what you got to do, I guess, you know. <laughs> so, oh God, this is so overwhelming for me. Yeah. I'm just more chill in LA to be <laughs> very honest. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. You got the sun and, you know, I think it's, I think there is a different vibe. Oh know, yeah. Different yeah. places. Yeah. They both have their pros and cons. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's everything, right? That's that's just how it is. What are you uh what are you up to next now that you got the book? The book, by the way, is called The Composer Cave Challenge. Just to give that a plug there. But uh anything uh what's next for you? 
Um, so I have actually been writing a lot of songs and I am producing them currently. My goal on my checklist is actually to produce an album. Hmm. But um, over the years, I realized like I was doing so many things that I never sat down to work on it like properly and set my intention. So for the past few months, I have just been swifting through all the songs that I've written and kind of trying to create a more, um, how do I say it, like a conceptual product. Mm -hmm. So I've just been working on that and I'm not, I'm going a little easy on myself with it. Good. At the same time, because <laughs> of the composer cave challenge, I've been writing a lot of instrumental music and so it kind of has turned into like, my songs and my instrumental music and I'm kind of trying to connect them together and see if there's a there's an album or a project that you know they kind of mix together and I create something so right now I'm pretty much in the process of just writing a lot of music and I think the book is like a byproduct of that okay yeah yeah, yeah. That, that's cool. Like you, you're getting like just a collection of work that you can kind of look for. Common yeah, threads. I was, I was very focused on. Okay, I need to release something every three months, or I need to release four songs every year. But during the pandemic, I really thought about it, and I was like, what if I worked on, a, I worked on a lot of music without giving without forcing myself to release something mm -hmm. what if i relied more on the natural progression of things so right now i'm pretty much just relying on the natural progression of things at the same time i do have enough music going on on the internet and i'm still um writing stuff and writing my blog and releasing a book and doing all those things. So hopefully like early 2021, I will have new music to share. Nice. Yeah. And there's a lot of good stuff on YouTube, especially some great, great performances and videos and off. Uh, yeah. I, I almost felt, uh, <laughs> kind of out of line. I, I, so you wrote a book now, what, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a big accomplishment. So, um, I think I'd you probably are probably right another one. Yeah. You're very <laughs> entitled to let things take the natural flow at this point. <laughs> um, I hope so. Like, uh, I also feel that when you are co trying to control like yourself too much, mm. because at some point I felt like I don't want to be releasing music for the heck of it. Like, I really want to be able to tell my story the way I would love to through my music. And I want to give myself the time to do it in a creative, beautiful way. Mm. And yeah, I'm just exploring that. And it's been fun because I'm actually amazed at the music that comes out when you are not too focused on the numbers or the deadlines or what somebody else would think. Yeah. Yeah. I can agree with that. I'm, I'm, I must sound like a hypocrite to some people listening, but, um, you know, it is great to have those like strict deadlines, the motivational things to just get you going and working and focused. Um, but there is also something to be said when you take that pressure away, it, yeah. it is a relief. And I, I go back and forth. I, I do put a lot of pressure on myself to be productive and do the variety of things that I like to do. So um, sometimes when it's just for fun and I know like this doesn't have to be anything and I'm just going to enjoy doing it, who cares what comes of it? And that's that's very a healthy thing to mix into. Glad yeah, you brought that for, up. Yeah, for me, the best things that I do are I don't even remember doing them. Like, I don't remember. I Okay, I wrote the book, but I also formatted it. I also did a lot of different things to actually bring it to life. And it took me, it probably took me hours and hours and hours of work, but I it actually just felt like a couple mm. of minutes. And that's when I know that, oh, I have to, because if if it's something really worth releasing, 
I probably don't even realize when I started and when I finished. Yeah. And sometimes I wake up and I'm like, wow, how did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> Who did that? <laughs> Who did that? Like, it's yeah. almost like somebody else is holding your hand and it's mm. almost like there is a presence around you. And I can't, I can't even explain it. That feeling is so calming. When you're totally in the zone and you're totally absorbed yeah. by, yeah, and I, the music I want to release, I want to feel like that from everything that I create, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I know what you're talking about. Sometimes I think of it almost like I found it, like I found yeah. the song or... Or like, it, like it was almost always there. <laughs> yeah. I just had my net and I just grabbed it one day. And, uh, but yeah, there is, there's, there's that. I'm happy to hear you say this too, just because you have so much of the academic background where you could really break this down technically. And, yeah. And, but still you recognize and feel that there's something like still a little magical going on here. Oh, yeah. And actually, I think I learned that because of academia. Oh, yeah? Yeah. One of my professors used to really encourage us to procrastinate. <laughs> 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 and like she, she has a PhD and she's very accomplished. And she would say, you know, you have to procrastinate. And then she would join the do dots for us. So she... Uh, she has an extensive research and she told us that one day she was at um you know the f those fairs where you can buy like little trinkets mm -hmm. yeah so she was at a flea market like a mm -hmm. flea and she was looking for a missing piece to her research and while she was at that flea she found like a newspaper like an old newspaper she bought a pen and the person wrapped it in a piece of newspaper and when she went home, she opened it and that missing piece of her research was there on that newspaper. Like hmm. there was an article about what she was researching. Wow. So like you said, like so many things we just find when we are, you know, creating. And it's like um, when I found my apartment in New York City, it was almost like I dreamt it. Hmm. <laughs> like there are so many things that have happened to me it's almost as if, wow, I, 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 I set an intention to find something like that. And then I did. Mm -hmm. I just trusted that, okay, I've done the work. And sometimes uh, when I write music, that feeling is always there. When I was working on my song, Someone Else's Arms, like I wrote the song. I had no idea how I'm going to end up producing it. But then somebody contacted me and he wanted to play guitar for me. And he did a beautiful job on the guitars and it just falls into place and it's amazing. Hmm. It's cool. That's that's part of the fun, you know. It's, it's 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 both technical, it's both you know, emotional and spiritual and yeah. all of those things we can't quite put our fingers on. It's a beautiful combination. <laughs> Well, it's been awesome talking to you. Um, I'm glad uh, we got a chance to do this. And um, I want people to go check out the book, The Composer Cave Challenge by Rivita. And um, also your your like work, your website, you, you've got a, a really nice, I think your YouTube is really nice. Um, and they can go to rivitamusic.com. That's R-I-V-I-T-A music.com. And that kind of, I think, gets everyone to where they might want to go. It's nice. Yeah. And there's even some cool, like, like I'm, I just kind of mentioned it briefly, but you've got some nice like tutorials there and some more like helpful educational things that people might be interested in, in as well. So um, yeah, lots, lots of great stuff to check out. So thank you for sharing that with us and taking the time to talk about it. Thank you for having the conversation with me and sharing my work with your audience. It means a lot. Yeah, my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And thank you all listening out there for your time and have a great day. Take care. <laughs>